The Cecil Hotel will reveal to you whatever it is you're a fugitive from. Steve Erickson If you're anything like me, you'll find yourself falling down a rabbit hole or two late at night. For me, those rabbit holes often drift into the unsolved corners of the internet. Today we'll take a peek down one such rabbit hole. Elisa Lamb Just 21 years old, Elisa Lamb was found floating inside a rooftop cistern at the long infamous Cecil Hotel. The circumstances surrounding her death are hazy, to say the least. With accusations of mishandling evidence, debates surrounding her mental health, and mysterious postings to her blog long after her death, there's no shortage of angles to dig into. Leading up to her time at the Cecil Hotel, Elisa had initially come to California seeking an escape from her studies. Traveling by bus and train, she made her way to San Diego to visit the zoo and sightsee, eventually finding her way to Los Angeles and booking a shared room at the Cecil. Just two days later, she was assigned a private room as a result of certain odd behaviors, as quoted from her roommates. For those first few days, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. With the hotel being located on Skid Row, whatever odd behaviors she might have had would have been largely ignored. With employees from businesses near the hotel mentioning how sweet and easygoing she was, the stage was set for her to be little more than a footnote in the hotel's guest book. A guest book loaded with tragedy from the get-go. During the 1930s, the Cecil had a string of suicides plague the hotel. With everything from poison pills to gunshot wounds, the hotel had begun to carve out its unfortunate reputation as a suicide hotspot. Here's also when we begin to see the first hint of a pattern. An unsolved death of a young woman, Grace E. Marco. She had fallen from the rooftop of the hotel and had her fall broken by telephone wires, which wrapped around her, later dying of her injuries in hospital. The police were never able to determine if she was pushed or jumped. Fast forward to the 40s and 50s, and we see some slowdown in the suicides, but even stranger circumstances surrounding the deaths. One case saw a young girl throw the child she had just birthed from the window of her room, believing the child to be stillborn. She was later found not guilty of murder by reason of insanity. The 1960s saw the largest spike in violence and solidified the hotel into the public mind with the Pigeon Lady murder. Pigeon Goldie Osgood was a retired telephone operator and was well known and loved in the area, regularly being found feeding pigeons in Pershing Square. Her body was found in her room at the Cecil Hotel by an employee of the hotel. Osgood had been severely beaten, stabbed, and raped. Her room had been ransacked, though little if anything was missing. Just hours after her murder, a 29-year-old man, Jacques B. Ellinger, was found in Pershing Square with blood-soaked clothes. Initially charged with the murder by police, he was later cleared of the charges, though the explanation for the blood-soaked clothes was never revealed. Her murder remains unsolved to this day. Two other apparent suicides would befall the hotel before Elisa Lamb's case would confuse and shock the country. As if the litany of deaths surrounding the hotel wasn't enough, Elizabeth Short, aka the Black Dahlia, was rumored to have frequented the hotel. Serial killers Richard Ramirez and Jack Unterweger both held residences at the Cecil Hotel during their killing sprees. All this paints a bleak reputation for unstable minds to find their end at the Cecil Hotel, either at their own hands or others. Elisa Lamb had maintained blogs from mid-2010 to just shortly before her passing. Most of her posts covering fashion and quotes she found uplifting, but one stands out. In January of 2012, Lamb lamented that a relapse at the start of her current school term had forced her to drop several classes, titling the post after a quote from the novelist Chuck Palahniuk, You're always haunted by the idea you're wasting your life. She went on to explain her fears about her transcript being rejected due to so many withdrawals and how it may prevent her from finishing her studies. Both of her blogs would adapt the quote as her epigraph. Fast forward a year, and we find her on the phone with her parents every day of her trip, meticulously keeping them up to date on her travels. On January 31st, 2013, the day she was supposed to check out of the Cecil, her parents never received a call. Fearing the worst, her parents called the LAPD to report her missing and booked flights to LA the same day. The day Lamb was reported missing, several members of the hotel staff reported seeing her alone. The manager of a nearby bookstore, Katie Orphan, saw Lamb earlier that day, saying that Lamb was outgoing and very friendly while she was shopping for gifts to bring home to her parents, and that Lamb was debating whether the book she wanted would be too heavy for her to keep in her bag as she traveled, casting an immediate shadow on her disappearance. A shadow that the LAPD didn't seem to agree with. 
The police searched her room and brought in dogs to try and find her scent in the hotel and on the rooftop. Unfortunately, no scent or trace of Elisa Lam was found. And the first of many odd happenings with the LAPD, the police didn't actually search every room or even the entire rooftop, leaving the area where she was eventually found unsearched and unsniffed. With the reputation of the hotel as a suicide destination, it's possible that the investigating officers had already assumed they were looking for a suicide, not a kidnapping or a murder victim. While just a theory, there is some evidence for this, as Sergeant Rudy Lopez later explained, that since they didn't believe there was a crime committed, they didn't have the probable cause needed to conduct a full search of the hotel. A full week later, on February 6th, the police asked for the public's help, posting flyers around the neighborhood and online, ultimately bringing the case to the media's attention. Another full week with no leads and no change in approach, the LAPD released the now infamous elevator video, showing the last time anyone saw Elisa Lam before her demise. But in many ways, the video begged more questions than it answered, with the timestamp carefully cropped out of frame and Lamb's mouth blurred several times. The elevator seems to malfunction as she repeatedly presses buttons and waits for the doors to close. But with each failure to close, she begins to panic more, rocking herself and covering her ears and growing increasingly erratic in her actions. Finally, the door closes. The video quickly went viral, gathering 3 million views and 40,000 comments in just 10 days on the Chinese site Yuku. Sadly, this would be the last we saw of Elisa Lam before her body was finally found floating inside of a thousand gallons of drinking water. Ultimately, guest complaints about strange odors and tastes to the showers and tap water led the investigators to open the tanks. The tank she was found in contained clothes similar to the ones that she wore in the elevator video, along with several of her personal effects, all floating with her. Notably, her cell phone was not with her and has never been found. Bizarrely, even with hundreds of hotel guests and patrons of the coffee shop having bathed and drank in the contaminated water, the hotel initially took little to no action, only hiring a water treatment specialist after the LAPD required them to do so. The hotel also declined many reporters' calls and inquiries regarding how they would handle the situation, instead leaving the details up to Terrence Powell, who was the director handling Los Angeles Health Department's response. With Powell ordering a resanitization of the coffee shop and requiring the building plumbing system to be disinfected by the hired specialist. At this stage, Sergeant Lopez calls her death suspicious, and the LAPD treats the rooftop as a crime scene finally suspecting foul play. The initial coroner's report listed accidental drowning as the cause of death, listing her bipolar disorder as a significant factor in her death. And therein lies the first of many significant points of doubt towards her case. In the following weeks, much debate was held over her mental state leading up to her death. And during this time, her blog had continued posting, leading people to wonder if the body was in fact Elisa Lam, or if somebody had stolen her phone and was posting as a sick joke. Tumblr had the ability to queue future posts, so it's also possible that these were simply what Lamb had planned on sharing with the world, again, casting doubt on her suicide. Four months later, June 24th, the LAPD finally released the full autopsy report, bizarrely with several key areas of evidence excluded, namely the rape kit and fingernail kit. The report never showing the results of those kits and never addressing whether the kits had even been tested both of which would have shown definitive proof of assault or foul play. The odd details of the report continued with the fact that when she was found, she was covered in a sand-like particulate, with a small amount of alcohol found in her system, along with trace amounts of ibuprofen and sinutab, and trace amounts of her prescriptions, Welbutrin, Lamictal, Seroquel, and Effexor. No illicit drugs were found in her system. The toxicology results casting even more questions onto her odd behavior in the elevator. The report went on to say that she had injuries consistent with both decomposition and rape, but as they had never tested or reported the results of the rape kit, we're left looking at another apparent assumption from the LAPD that this was a suicide. An assumption that would seem to contradict Sergeant Lopez's assertion that foul play may have been involved. Sadly, a definitive answer to what happened to Elisa Lam has yet to be decided. We know where she ended up, but not how or when she got there or even whether or not she was placed there or suffered a breakdown leading to her untimely death. The questions surrounding her case seem to only grow as time goes on. Where was the ladder? The cisterns don't have a permanently attached ladder. 
meaning one would need to be brought from elsewhere in the hotel, making her entry to the cistern a much more deliberate act than a simple drug stupor induced accident would suggest. Additionally, the ladder she would have had to have used to climb inside the cistern was not found near the cistern, meaning either it had been removed by an employee or possibly the murderer after she was placed slash entered the cistern. A detail that would have been answered had the LAPD searched the entire rooftop the day that she was reported missing. Why was there no full search? Why did the LAPD seem convinced that there was no foul play involved from the get-go? Their fear of entering every room is forgivable in case she turned out to have not been the victim of foul play, but the decision to not search the entire roof where no one's privacy concerns had to be considered is one that simply can't be overlooked, especially as they had police dogs with them that were sniffing her out. Any trace of her on the ladder or the area surrounding the cisterns the day after her disappearance would have likely still held her scent. If Elisa Lamb was suicidal due to her bipolar diagnosis, why was there no blog post, letter, voicemail, or email left behind? For a woman who had a pattern of sharing her disappointments and depressed moods in the past, why had she left nothing behind? never once mentioning anything out of the ordinary to her parents, or saying any kind of final goodbye. Why didn't the LAPD obtain a warrant to search the entire hotel after the initial 48 hours had passed? In most cases, missing persons aren't even investigated until after this period. So why had they been so quick to investigate her disappearance, only to then drag their feet for the next two weeks? Why were the rape and fingernail kits either never tested or the results never published? Especially after the sergeant in charge of the case asserted that foul play may have been involved. Testing those kits would have definitively shown that the police were correct to assume suicide, quieting any further question or blame directed at the apparent mishandling of the first few days of the case. Why did the hotel attempt to discredit the public about the limited access to the rooftop? saying that all the doors leading to the roof are alarmed and require a key, only to then be proven wrong by a video showing how the building's fire escapes grant you access with no alarm being sounded and no key required. How would the relatively small-built woman have moved the heavy concrete lid off the water cistern while outside of it, only to then place it back on completely while floating in the water inside of it? Many theories attempt to answer these and many more questions brought up by the odd happenings of this case. Here are some of the most interesting or believable theories from the internet sleuths and concerned public alike. Theory 1. The murder of Elisa Lam and the LAPD cover-up. This one is pretty straightforward. Many people believe that given all the odd mishandlings of evidence, and the tampering with the video footage collected, that the LAPD had something to hide. This theory suggests that during the initial search, Elisa Lamb was being held in one of the unsearched rooms. In the days following, the theory states she was raped and drowned by her captor, who then kept her body in a sandbag or tub filled with sand or kitty litter to absorb the smell and fluids while the captor waited for the police to be gone long enough for them to then hide the body in the cistern. If Lamb was in fact alive during the initial search, then the LAPD's apparent assumption of no foul play and subsequent mishandling of the search would make them liable for her death, leading them to alter the video to hide the date that it was recorded. The blurring of her mouth and missing minute of footage was to hide the identity of the person who found her as she tried to escape her captor before they killed her. The theory goes on to suggest that the LAPD paid off the person cut from the elevator video in their effort to shift blame away from the department. Some extreme versions of this theory suggest the police moved her body from one of the unsearched rooms into the cistern to further confuse any future accusations, as there are no video cameras on the rooftop, a detail that the LAPD knew as a result of their first search. The delay in releasing the full coroner's report and missing evidence in the report, along with the insistence of a bipolar and depression-fueled suicide, were all a disinformation attempt to ensure the public had enough doubt about her mental stability that they wouldn't question the LAPD's findings. Theory 2. Tuberculosis outbreak and dry drowning. The next theory is a little larger in its scale and much more disturbing. On February 21st, 2013, several news outlets broke a story involving one Lam Elisa. However, this was not a young Chinese-Canadian woman, 
but instead a test kit being deployed for an outbreak of tuberculosis in LA Skid Row. Not only is TB the most contagious disease on the planet, it can also present as acute pneumonia with respiratory failure. Pneumonia so bad that you drown inside of your own body. This outbreak was the largest that California had seen in 80 years and caused so much concern that the CDC investigated and assisted in handling it. Coincidentally, Elisa Lamb's body was found in a water tower, having drowned. This theory argues two points. One, that Elisa Lamb was a false flag of sorts, and two, that her body was moved to the water tower to cover up the outbreak. It suggests that the LAPD came across a murder victim with a convenient name, digitally covering up the search terms associated with the outbreak. Elisa Lamb or Lamb Elisa, Los Angeles, Skid Row, drowning, bad water, water contamination, bad water smell, water testing, Skid Row testing, and searching Skid Row are just a few of the search terms that conveniently now showed her case as opposed to the previously reported outbreak. The theory goes on to suggest that the officials within the LAPD who were working with the CDC and local health departments to manage the outbreak altered her crime scene and location to obscure those search results and minimize public panic over the outbreak, handling the actual murderer out of the public eye and ensuring that the autopsy backed up their claim of a bizarre water cistern suicide, explaining the edited elevator video as removing the actual killer from the footage and leaving out the fingernail and rape kit as evidence to allow them to say that it was suicide. The LAPD moving the body and altering evidence would also explain the missing ladder and moving the heavy concrete lid on the cistern. But most interestingly, it would also explain the missing phone, as if she had in fact been murdered elsewhere, the GPS on her phone would have reflected this. And as she was a Canadian tourist just visiting, she likely would have been either using a prepaid phone or a SIM card, both of which have a certain level of anonymity as they can be purchased with cash and have no name attached. Meaning the only concrete proof that her phone number was actually hers would be the phone itself and the tracking data contained within said phone. Meaning they would have had to have hidden it in evidence or simply disposed of it to cover up the moving of her body to the Cecil. This would also explain the hotel's response to the health concerns regarding tainted water, as they were already aware that the water in Skid Row was tainted with TB from the outbreak. Requiring the hotel to clean their plumbing system would have been required anyways as a result of the outbreak and gave them yet another false flag to obscure search results related to handling the effects of the outbreak. Theory 3. The Exorcist Theory. This one is for anyone who believes in the supernatural just as firmly as the natural. The Cecil Hotel is noted as one of the most haunted or possessed hotels in all of California, with ghost hunters and hotel guests alike having reported bizarre happenings within the hotel. What if the suicides and murders that have plagued this hotel are the result of some unseen specter, a ghost who never really left, or one that was never welcome in the first place? The theory suggests that all of the murders and suicides are the handiwork of a ghost or demon possessing guests of the hotel, driving them to kill either themselves or others. A young woman throwing her child out of a window after giving birth to it? A vicious rape and murder of an elderly woman? Two serial killer residents? Vulnerable men and women being taken advantage of by a spirit of murder, waiting for the right mix of superstitious and vulnerable people to use. With nearly 80 years of deaths associated with the Hotel Cecil, is it any wonder that someone or something might have unfinished business there? Outlandish? Absolutely. Impossible? That's for you to decide. Theory four, case closed. Lastly, what if the police got it right? What if Elisa Lamb was a functional bipolar depressive who was looking to escape the stress of her studies. She regularly posted about feeling like a failure and worrying about not being allowed to finish her education. What if on the day of her disappearance, Elisa Lamb finally found out that she would not in fact be allowed to continue her schooling? Her rest and retreat shattered as the news sinks in. She feels the weight of all her little failures settle on her and she begins to drink. The various prescriptions she had to balance her moods all explicitly labeled to avoid taking with alcohol, but not knowing the bad news to come, she had taken them as usual earlier that day, forgetting all about the warnings in her anguish. 
Wellbutrin in particular, when mixed with alcohol, can cause you to become increasingly paranoid and act erratically and move in jarring or nonsensical patterns, much like what she had done in the elevator video. With the possibility that the LAPD removed the section of footage to protect someone's privacy at their request, or as part of another case. In her unstable state, it would have been easy to stumble about in a daze until finding herself first on a fire escape and later on the roof. In such a state, pain from overexerting yourself goes away, allowing you to move objects much heavier than you'd be able to when sober, similar to a mother moving a car off her child in panic. As she closed the top of the cistern, she would have had no idea where she was or why she was there, passing in relative peace as she passed out and never woke. The latter either being blown over and picked up by an employee or removed by a hotel employee the following day, unaware of why it had been there at all. Her phone dropped along the way to the rooftop or sucked down the drain of the cistern, we may never know. With the LAPD leaving out evidence from the report simply to avoid any unnecessary information, as the tests easily could have come back negative, the long wait before its release, just thorough examination of the evidence. Careful double checking and testing as the water would have washed away and diluted a considerable amount of whatever was in or on her body and the sand-like particles, a simple body scrub or actual sand from the day before. Elisa Lamb was a 21-year-old girl loved by her family and seemingly enjoyed by everyone she met. Haunted by her struggle to handle life's hurdles and her pursuit of her own self, she deserved more than she received in passing. And I personally like to think that she died as she lived. A little bit broken, but happy. We all die. The goal isn't to live forever. The goal is to create something that will. Chuck Palahniuk.